Uh, good, more, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to participate in this panel. We are facing very many challenges, and we hear about them daily. You heard about them in this uh, audience, yet I'm deeply convinced uh, that uh, uh, peace will come after war, and we are to answer the question about how Ukraine is going to live on and what kind of a country it will be. And I want it to be a very modern and a very European and a very democratic nation. A country in which the people have the right to participate in governance and to get engaged in everything that goes on. Regrettably, the system that we inherited uh, is very much centralized uh, by and large. Uh, the system is not oriented towards uh, ordinary people. It's rather oriented towards officials and meeting their needs. Uh, and uh, partly it is the system to blame for what is going on now. And the system has to be changed. In the context of decentralization of power, I'll tell you that this is not an end in itself. We have have to build a good and proper system of governance. And I believe that it's impossible to build such a system, a person-oriented system, without participation of the people. And the question is, what kind of a model to build? And it has to do with the local government. It has to do with empowering the communities to make the decisions that have to do with their lives. And the government developed a number of very specific decisions and solutions uh, that will allow building a quality model of governance. We need to establish a very good territorial foundation. And by that, I mean our communities that should be able to make their money and not to transfer that money to the government in Kyiv. Uh, we want local government uh, to become uh, universal and omnipresent, because at present most decisions are made here in the capital, and local communities can hardly participate in the processes that occur in each town, in each uh, city, in each district. Uh, we still have uh, oblast and district administrations that are not elected but appointed. And this is something to change. And uh, for that, we need to amend our constitution and to pass new laws. And some have already been drafted and submitted to the parliament. Uh, uh, there are two magic numbers for Ukraine. 226. That's the voting majority in the parliament. That's the number of votes needed to pass a decision. And 300. That's the number of votes to amend the constitution and to lift the restrictions on participation of the people in everyday life. I do believe that Ukraine has a tremendous potential. And the mechanism of establishing proper self-government that we propose rests upon European experience. It is going to be the means that will allow every community and every town and every village uh, get the rural population involved in life and make that life better. We need to uh, strengthen the civil society. We want the society to participate in the decision-making process. And this is what we have to implement in Ukraine. Time is ripe for that. And I am certain that this is the, what the society expects from us. That's a terrific uh, opening gambit for this panel. and. Uh, I just want to be clear on one thing, because it, it seems very important to me. You, you talk about a huge degree of restructuring and decentralization. You, you seem to be saying that, that the regions should keep their own money, should in essence be independent economies. Uh, am I reading you right when you go as far as that? Uh, well, uh, uh, 
thanks for your question. Well, the community is to be the uh, basic link in the system and practically everything that uh, a community has to receive is uh, to become the principal. Every level is to get its functions and its finance and all that is to be in accordance with the principles of subsidiarity. Uh, you, you, you've given us a commitment, a governmental commitment to this new structure and to a commitment to reform. Obviously, we all know there are elections coming in Ukraine and we'll see what kind of politicians are forming the government after the election and how committed they are to following through on some of your words. And we'll talk about that. But actually, as we've got Tim next to you, Timothy Snyder, I want you to give us a slightly sort of more historical and, and maybe broad brush perspective uh, if you would, Timothy, and uh, reflect on what uh, Arseny Yatsenyuk said to me this morning. He said, Stephen, I want you to understand there never was, there is not and never was a civil conflict, a civil war in Ukraine. This is a conflict between us, Ukraine, and Russia, Moscow. I want you to reflect on whether you believe that to be true or whether there is, in your view, a civil conflict internal conflict right now in Ukraine? Well, you don't have to choose between those two views. As I see it, there are two different problems. One, a short-term problem, a conflict with Russia, a conflict with Russia which by its nature demands international support, American, European, and really global, and a long-term issue, which is the, the proper redistribution of financial and political responsibility throughout the country. And I, I think the crucial intellectual challenge in all of this is actually keeping those two things apart. Because the, the people who are in fact driving the conflict and to some extent taking advantage of understandable local resentments have, a, have one vision of what to do with the Ukrainian state. And that vision is something that you could call forced federalization, um, where the model, historical model, actually seems to be the fate of Czechoslovakia in 1938, where first you make up a name of a territory. Sudetenland was not actually a historical name. It was invented by Hitler to be the name of the territory he wanted to take, like Novorossiya. Um, second, you force a country into federation. So before Czechoslovakia was destroyed, we forget this, but before it was destroyed, it was turned into a Czechoslovakia, a forced federation. Then Slovakia became an independent state. Then the state was destroyed. That seems to be the model for, for Russian policy, a forced federation. Uh, that is are, are you, sorry, but just to be clear, yeah. are you saying that there is no significant body of opinion in the east of Ukraine that wants that sort of federalization? Um, I think that's a, look, I think it's a very important to make the distinction between what people in Moscow want and what people in Donetsk and Luhansk want. People in Donetsk and Luhansk can express what they want in local elections or in opinion polls. The, according to the opinion polls we had up until 2013, almost nobody wanted unity with Russia. Some people wanted some kind of decentralization. Then you have a conversation, right? And the, sec the second problem is the issue of how the Ukrainian state should look. And I, I would, I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a politician, I think the, the ways that Vice, Vice Premier Groisman phrased this could be strengthened. I think when you're talking about decentralization in Ukraine, you're actually talking about state building. This is, we don't have a strong state to start out with. It's not as though you have a strong state in Kiev, which you can then distribute around. You have a weak state. And one way to strengthen the state is to decentralize. So I think the way to, re the way to think about this reform is not that you're weakening the central state. It's that you're building more state capacity in a place where you don't have any. But you can only do that if you are confident in the center that by offering more powers to the regions through decentralization, you are not actually hastening a process of fragmentation. That there is a basic commitment to the unitary sovereign state at all levels in all quarters. Well, 
I mean, constitutionally, you obviously keep three major things, at least. You keep the military, mm -hmm. you keep foreign policy, and you keep information policy. But I, I actually think, I think the argument runs exactly the opposite way, because the problem in Ukrainian politics is that it's an all-or-nothing game where the presidential elections and the parliamentary elections decide everything, which is why you have to have Maidans, and that's why you're going to keep having Maidans into the future if there's not decentralization. So it, it, the decentralization is an answer to Maidans because it means that, I mean, if, even if you like one of them, you don't think that's the right way to run a country, right? You don't want to have them forever. Decentralization is the way to keep people keep people's political views channeled into ways which they think they can influence. And I think that actually, in a way, is what the Maidan was all about. Donetsk and Luhansk are special cases, but they're not really so different. The complaints that people have in Donetsk and Luhansk about the, about the state and about corruption are not so different from the complaints people have in Ivano-Frankivsk. So I would say, in a way, that's a special example of how decentralization, if the conflict can be stopped, which is a separate issue, um, is a way of state building. Because right. there you really can build from the ground up. Especially because, as I began, the Russian strategy was precisely to destroy the state. There is, I mean, with apologies to Mr. Taruta, there is very little state capacity there now. So it's an opportunity to build things up from the beginning. An opportunity for the key of state to look good, in fact. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. It's fascinating. Uh, Eva Tam, I know you were wanting to get in uh, as Timothy was talking, and, and it seems to me a really good thing we've got you on the panel because we're talking about ways you can change the power structure in a country, both to decentralize it and enhance its its overall strength. You could look at Belgium two ways. I lived in Belgium. I know sort of what a complicated system Belgium has. On uh, The glass half full case says, you know what, Belgium is a, a country of two linguistic and cultural traditions, which by and large works and is a prosperous member of the West European family, even though it has this different difference within it. The glass half empty, response would be, yeah, but it's so dysfunctional. Belgium could be so much better run, more efficient, if only there wasn't, you know, the Flemish doing this, the Walloons doing that, and the constant suspicion and tension between the two peoples. Uh, so when you talk decentralization, do you look at your own country and think, God, I don't want Ukraine to go down that route, or do you think Belgium has a useful, positive model to offer? I think Belgium is unique and is not, uh, let's say, federalism is not our best uh, export product, even if there would be a market uh, here, uh, but that's not the case. But I would like to say, uh, well, first of all, I think there is a, a global consensus that in all countries, in all modern economies, that in all well-performing economies, that uh, multi-level governance, multi-level administration and subsidiarity are two very important tools just to render your governance and administration efficient. I think that's, that's a matter of fact. But I would like to put four critical remarks to the debate as I was uh, witnessing it, a little bit from the outside, the debate that's going on in the Ukraine as a whole, in the media, and also these days in this uh, very interesting and very well-organized events. First of all, I think it is very important, and the colleague already pointed it out, to really know what we are talking about and very precisely know what decentralization is and what it is now. Not, it's more than deconcentration, just organizing administrations from Kiev in Donetsk and make them perform better, but it's less than federalism. So when we engage in a debate, when we engage in negotiations, in actions from, from the government, and uh, in cooperation with people in the, in the oblasts and, and, and locally, all the people, all the stakeholders should know that it's really talking about decentralization and that it's uh, not good to pollute the debate with expectan expectancies that cannot be met. So you, you, Second, you're saying you can't, uh, when we talk decentralization, you can't say federalism is a form of decentralization. Federalism is something completely different. It's different. It's different. Some conditions to talk about federalism are not met by, de by uh, decentralization. Secondly, I think decentralization is not a peacemaker. 
it can help to, to guarantee peace once you have a, a peaceful situation right. and, and to, to cater for all kinds of uh, conflict resolving um, um, approaches, but it's not a peacemaker. Let's not mingle it up, let's not mix it up. Three, a condition to organize decentralization is that you have peace in that sense that all people in the Ukraine, all uh, people that sit around the table, accept to apply what is decided in that debate all over the place in all parts of the territory. Last but not least, and that's a typical element from the Belgian experience, we talk about decentralization from a very territorial approach. Uh, the debate is about, well, what could we give as a competence to, um, and some autonomy to the oblasts? What could we give to the rayons? What could we give to the local authorities? I think another approach, and this is a typical experience in Belgium, it would be useful, for instance, to uh, organize or to think about organizing some decentralization to not territories, but to uh, communities, to people, groups of people that are gathered around the use of the language and then you can talk about education, health service, what we call in Belgium the person linked um, actions of public authority. So that, that could a little bit, um, well, nuance the debate which uh, from the start has the danger when you when you limit it to a territorial approach to be very close to discussions uh, like federalism and uh, about splitting up the country. And in fact, it's a neat way of, of moving over to, to, to my right and to you, uh, Mr. Chubarov, because you know you represent the Tatar people, and obviously the Tatar people have seen their political context, your, your, the realities that you live under, completely changed in Crimea, where Russia obviously now calls the shots and has annexed the territory. Um, and I wonder, you know, you are the acting head of the Majlis. Uh, what you feel about this debate generated inside Ukraine now about how to uh, maintain a, the integrity of, of a nation state and find a path to decentralization of power? What, what, what do your people bring to the table in this debate? What do you want? Thank you very much. I'd like to say that among many factors that allowed Russia to annex Crimea, I would also add the imperfect status of uh, Crimean autonomy. Take a note, in Ukraine now we have a number of uh, laws that designate the authority of Crimea as a republic, that uh, define relations between Simferopol and Crimea, and we also have a whole chapter in the Ukrainian constitution which is called the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. But if you ask whether all those laws and the division of power have led to the situation whereby in Crimea people felt themselves better than in other regions, the answer would be no. In many spheres, Crimea was in a worse position than a usual region of Ukraine. If we want to talk about decentralization as a tool for the strengthening of a state, we should be more precise in what we understand under decentralization when we are talking about decentralization. And it was mentioned here, if these are the measures that are aimed at the development of territories, at the improvement of the functioning of authorities, but at the same moment, communities do not have a systemic guaranteed opportunities to compose, to form this authority, to take part in this authority, then we would not achieve anything with formal decentralization, but the situation is going to become even worse. Here I would like to quote the Crimean experience and Crimean situation. We have to draw conclusions from this lesson. Ukraine is not just a multinational country. In some territories, 
there is a rather complex and a very interesting historical experience and the system of uh, power that was built by bestowing a special status on Crimea in general had not taken into account the existence of Crimean Tatar people for whom this land is not just their homeland but who at the moment of the proclamation of the independence of Ukraine we were just coming back from deportation and in such an autonomy where Crimean Tatars were coming back were in fact excluded from all the spheres of life of uh, society and first of all from taking part in the governing of the territory this led to the situation where other factors took the dominant position I'd like to conclude my remarks with an emphasis on the fact that taking care of uh, how we will develop Ukraine after we overcome the crisis and this means after we overcome the crisis I mean that this includes the return of Crimea to Ukraine we even now have to write down the formulas of decentralization for the Crimean situation we have to take into account obligatory the experience of some European countries a year before this crisis erupted and a year before Crimea was occupied a group of uh, M of councillors from the Supreme Council of uh, Crimea were in southern Tyrol in Italy in Italy we learned the situation of balance and taking into account the interests of the between the German speaking uh, majority in southern Tyrol and also the minority Italian speaking minority and the indigenous people of Ladinas we saw a package of laws that was passed and uh, that's in action and that have balanced the interests of those three ethnic groups to the extent that here we could talk about a stable situation the loss of Crimea happened also because the most vulnerable ethnic community in the Ukrainian conditions happened to be the most fierce defenders of Ukrainian statehood however they did not have any mechanisms of doing this if we were able to solve this issue within the 23 years of independence we would have some tools of governing the territory and this includes everybody Russians and Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars who lived there and we all together would not have allowed anyone to annex this territory and we would have remained in within Ukraine no assuming one day Crimea is restored to Ukraine lessons to be learned about how to change uh, the internal dynamic with regard to the Tatar people. I just want to ask you one question of detail, which I'm afraid it reveals my ignorance. Just tell me, uh, just very simply, how many of the Tatar people in Crimea are currently living outside of their homes? How many fled and are currently living as displaced people as a result of the Russian annexation of Crimea? Is it, is it many of your people who are currently um, not living in their own homes? no one can quote you a precise statistics at the moment we can say that almost up to 17 to 20 thousand people of different ethnic groups fled Crimea among them seven to eight thousand Crimean Tatars this morning I came back from Lviv 
where there is a uh, biggest Russian ethnic and Crimean Tatar community who fled Crimea. We had a meeting yesterday and tried to look for solutions of their problems. All those people have in mind coming back to Crimea and they are expecting some very precise and specific mechanisms. Um, from Minister Groisman, but uh, I want to bring uh, Serhii Taruta in now because Mr. Taruta, I mean, you're key to this discussion because you uh, represent the, the leadership of the regional government in Donetsk and yet, you know, Donetsk itself and significant chunk of territory is entirely beyond the control of the Ukrainian state at the moment. So um, my question to you is, is this. Sometimes when you listen to Ukrainian leaders talk about the terrorists who are uh, conducting this campaign for separation, it seems that they're close to concluding that any civilian in eastern Ukraine who wants separation or integration with Russia is a terrorist. Is that in any way a useful way to conduct the conversation with the east of Ukraine. And I wonder from you how you believe confidence and trust can be restored so that a meaningful political process can draw the civilian population of Donetsk and the east into a future in Ukraine. Well, as for Donetsk region, as far as Donetsk Oblast is concerned, decentralization has already taken place there. Uh, well, we, uh, without presence of Russia, it would have been different. Uh, you know, they took power, but uh, it can be seen that they are not the leaders who can really lead this region to happy life. But talking seriously, the grounds of, these, of this crisis is the old archaic uh, management or governance system. What was the case? Actually, the president used to appoint the governors, uh, and the criterion was uh, clear uh, because of uh, political views. Um, then this oblast was just uh, given to governors' discretion. The governors could do whatever they wanted, even didn't know anything about that, and the people were just suffering. It uh, was problem of all regions of Ukraine. And maybe the last president who never talked about decentralization during the campaign was Mr. Kuchma. All other presidents after him, Mr. Yushchenko, Mr. Yanukovych, and Mr. Poroshenko, all of them talk about decentralization and transfer or delegation of powers. What can we see? In fact, they all just took more power from the regions. And Maidan is the result of this fact because the people in the center could not really dispose of these powers properly. And we need not only the decentralization, we need to implement reforms. We need deregulation and reforms in many areas, law enforcement, justice, defense, so that these authorities, which represent the central power at the local level, still uh, make them acceptable for the local people so that the regions can develop properly. <laughs> well, in the very right uh, from the outset of my mandate, uh, I had this discussion with Victor about transfer of powers. Uh, we reached full consensus. We agreed that we would take the Polish model as uh, the basis. Uh, like Mr. Barroso yesterday said, in 1992, we had the same situation that in Poland. Actually, I bought an enterprise in Poland, and I can see the way uh, the pol uh, Poland changed uh, since 2003 until 2013. Why? Because the power was not concentrated in Warsaw. 
they gave out uh, some of their powers. In fact, what we see in Poland is uh, the features of federative state. And when I talk to my compatriots and I hear from them, the word uh, federalization because what they want they just want a better life uh, and how can, can you do it better because they would receive some of the powers and they would be able to control their areas uh, when I tell them uh, that the federalization is just uh, one more uh, station hierarchy of the bureaucrats they say no we do not need that just give us power to the local level delegated and I cannot see any reasons for not doing that uh, and uh, here I actually have a certain team at the administration and I tell them every day where we are late when Prime Minister said Mr. Yatsenyuk that we did a lot uh, but many things have not been done why? because of the parliament believe me at this stage, this parliament is the best to reform. You know, they want to confess in front of the priest, and priest is the society. They are ready to confess. Uh, just give them these bills, draft laws, and we will work all together because the people's deputy represent regions, and we will create sites at the local level which will make these bureaucrats at the local level uh, make them implement all these ideas. Uh, we understand that the centralization process is quite long, uh, like you need to change the constitution, and we suggested accelerated option. We suggested to draft laws uh, on uh, the change. One was about experimental decentralization in a certain area that would allow for hmm, using that model in two oblasts, Luhansk and Donetsk, and symmetrically in two western uh, oblasts. And also we will change the budget code by law. Let's do it because this is something we can do and uh, we're still idling. So I believe that now is uh, the right time. I read the newspaper, Zerkala uh, Tezhnya, and I, I mean, I wrote an article, and I, I said to understand the main problem now is the war, the war on the East. It's a very tough war, unprecedented war. And in fact, uh, I cannot think about any other armed conflict after World War II, where so many massive fire systems would uh, be used every day. They use this massive fire artil artillery systems, self-propelled rocket. They shoot uh, or they open fire against the cities and towns, uh, pretending to be the Ukrainian government. <laughs> But, you know, people want to forget any horrors of the war as quickly as possible. I visited Slovensk. The people already forgot about that. They want the government just to, um, to assist them in reconstruction, and they want to have their future. Because absence of the future was the basic reason why the people from Donbass uh, uh, was so easy cheated by this provocation with this information. That's why our uh, task of the government today is, is not the task to work in the peace time. We need to work as we have to in the war time. Yes, this is undeclared war, but the people are killed. The people are suffering the same, same way that it happens during the war. And we need to learn from experience of World War II. Yes, we can say many bad things about Stalin, but I would mention here the industries representatives at the time, the, Mr. Kuchma knows the generation very good. I mean, it took half a year for the country to start production of military equipment in Siberia. They moved to the enterprises very quickly, and we now should not wait for too long. We do not, we cannot allow this long approving cycle. Roger, I, I know that Mr. you've got to go, Mr. Graceman, and I know you want to come back on some of the things you've heard, and I believe you then, you, you, you've got business away from this meeting, which means you, you may have to leave, that's what I was told. So I'm just going to invite you to give us your closing 
thoughts. I mean, there's a sense of urgency from Mr. Taruta, and he says, look, ideally, of course, I guess nobody would quarrel with the idea that you, you conduct decentralization as a strategic objective in an era of, of calm and stability, but there isn't an era of calm and stability, but you've still got to address the needs and the aspirations of the people of the East. So, you know, you've got to figure out how to do it in far from ideal conditions in a very tight time frame, and I'm wondering how you're going to do it. But give, it, give us your closing thoughts. Yes, I would like to uh, say something and to respond to Mr. Taruta's words. Uh, uh, President Kuchmo in 1996 uh, blessed uh, and signed uh, the law of local self-government. It was quite a good law that became the basis of local self-government and was such basis until 2005. Then we had to move on and uh, amendments were made into that law after 2005 and thus the entire law got destroyed. Uh, another thing I want to mention today is that I uh, wouldn't be that satisfied uh, with the decentralization in Donbass. Uh, there is a lot of pain in Donbass. The people are uh, dying there. It's not decentralization. It's uh, crime. Thousands of lives were lost. It's uh, destruction. It's occupation. It's aggression. And this is not what the people wanted. We have to understand what decentralization implies at each level, at the level of a territorial community, at higher levels, uh, there are to be funds and the possibilities to make decisions on the lives of these communities. Let me furnish an example in order to show how centralized Ukraine is now. Every single budget today is formed at the expense of transfers from the national budget. Just one small example, the city of Poltava. In order to borrow in the framework of an international program, 280,000 euros, the city of Poltava needs a special and specific decision of the government allowing it. And that's just one illustration of how much we are centralized at present. And everything that belongs to the communities is also used at the central level. Uh, it's uh, really a tortious uh, centralization that gives birth to corruption and which uh, uh, generates indifference at the local level because those who want to do something cannot do that. They would like to get some power, but they can because uh, the elections were never transparent. It was possible to buy a seat in the council plus those appointed governors uh, who are not liked because they are strangers and the people want some of their own to have that power. Uh, so we are to do away with the fragmentation of the communities. Uh, if the community is the principal link, it is to be powerful enough and more powerful than a very small community. That's why we created two mechanisms, uh, a cooperation of territorial communities, and the relevant law was passed by the parliament, and the parliament also in the first reading for the law on voluntary agglomeration of uh, territorial communities, and that will allow how to establish the basis for proper functioning of the communities. And uh, Mr. Taruto, well, give me two minutes more, please. Uh, legislation. Uh, presently in the Parliament, uh, I apply the uh, draft amendments to the tax code and to the uh, budget code. Uh, and uh, these amendments are about leaving part of the taxes in the communities, which will make it possible to better plan, especially the medium-term development programs. And thirdly, 
I am very thankful to the President of Ukraine for having uh, accepted the proposals to his version of the new Constitution regarding universality of local government and everything in the regions and in the districts will be decided in terms of the election of the uh, leaders and of their appointment from Kyiv. And thus the system will face the uh, people and uh, new content uh, uh, will appear in self-government and the civil society will get empowered. Thank you. Because I, somebody did mention to me that you may have an engagement you need to leave for. You know, do leave. When you need to leave, we understand. So uh, do whatever you need to do. Uh, I, I need to get to Roger now. Roger Meissen, uh, you know, when people outside of Ukraine, maybe some of us who don't know so much about Ukraine, uh, talk about and think about the Ukrainian situation much of the focus when it comes to the apparent divisions in the country uh, are discussed in terms of the Russian language, of the cultural sort of identity and aspirations of people in the East and a feeling that, you know, they, they have a, a sort of uh, an identity which looks toward Russia. And that is linguistic and cultural as much as anything. But I want you to talk about raw economics and whether you see both an economic analysis and economic solutions to this conundrum of how to organize Ukraine uh, for it to be a, a successful um, body politic in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a specialist in this area. I have to say my, my understanding of history, my understanding of, of, the, of the linguistic uh, variations that, that exist here is that surely they are not so so deep and 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 and, and, and emotional as as in Belgium, which succeeds in living together? Uh, but I do want to say yes. There are fundamental reasons to to for for Ukrainians to think that that to believe, as has been expressed by others, in for for quite normal reasons that an excessively centralized government is the root of much problems, both in terms of the quality of government and in terms of the, the separatism. Um, it's, I'm not a specialist in this region. Seven years ago, I learned something from someone who had helped to work on the Ukrainian constitution, and I realized that, that something about, I, I, just, I learned that there was a, a unique and kind of extreme form of centralism that in a part, in a, uh, in a parliamentary system, having a popularly elected president be responsible, have the to, for directing local government, that's that's unique. And that's when I, that's so. My interest, my my involvement with with your country, is has come from a concern about an extreme form of centralization in the constitution, which I saw as problematic. Uh, I wrote some things some years ago about this. It was unfortunately only this year that uh, that that when the president of Russia started calling for decentralization that, uh, that, that I began to find uh, Ukrainian f colleagues who, who, who realized we should be mobilized to, uh, to, the, to, to participate in a, in, a, in a growing discussion here. But the first thing I want to say is, from fundamental reasons, as a, an economist and a political scientist, I'm a game theorist, I study how the rules of the game affect behavior and constitutions of the rules of the game, decentralization of a political decentralization can be good for the people of Ukraine in spite of the fact that something like that seems to be asked for by the president of a foreign power. Um, I see two fundamental advantages and the, the advantage people mostly talk about is allowing uh, po local policies to meet local tastes such as about language and that certainly is true. But I see two more fundamental advantages. One is about better government. We've, the main theme at this great conference today has been about improving governance, and there are, it's hard to say exactly where to start, but I think decentralization is one of the best places. Everyone understands, and it's been said frequently in the earlier sessions today, that reforms to reduce corruption need to begin with, with good leadership at the top. The question is, how do you get good leadership at the top? And uh, we've got people who have been present, who have virtues and, and, and limitations. We all do. The basic question I'd like people to ask is, 
when, if you're going to reform the structure of government so as to try to guarantee that this country can have the best possible leaders 20, 40, 60 years from now, what reforms would you consider to give Ukraine the best possible leaders in the future generations from now? How would you reform the government? And I think what you'll realize is responsible subnational government, response, real responsibility for locally elected mayors, uh, provincial heads of government, ob oblast heads and, and rayon heads, giving municipal and, and, and provincial leaders who have been locally elected real budgetary responsibility is the best way to identify, the, the, the voters can identify those leaders who do a superior job of serving the, the people and then get elected to higher office. It happens. We have a former prime minister who was, who I, I, I'm going to guess did pretty well on the, on the city council of Ypres before he got raised to higher responsibilities. Uh, it, is, it is very common, the, the, a, a very successful chief minister of Gujarat province in India became, has been elected prime minister of India with hopes of reforming. So in sporting terms, you're saying you've got to understand you, you, you need the uh, strong, strong minor leagues yes. which have real meaning uh, to prove the mettle of those who then enter the major league. Decentra lower level democracy makes national democracy more competitive because you then have, instead of just you have, you have some, some, not necessarily all, but you get have some candidates who have actually shown what they can do with a public budget in serving the people better, than, and that creates better competition at the national level and better, better government. But, but what if you have in Ukraine a situation where money talks at all levels and that actual leadership is all too often tied to people who've got money the biggest wallets? Money talks in, in the United States also. I don't know about other countries, but uh, Ukraine and, and the United States uh, Ultimately, though, uh, whatever propaganda you can buy on television with, mon with control or with money, um, ultimately the voters have to make the decisions. And when voters notice that somebody in another province is, doing, has, is getting better services, serving the public better, word gets out. And, uh, and, and wait, 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 yeah. wait, I get you. So For I want sure. you to think that, that it's candidates going up and down. It's also not feudalism. People think that decentralization means local bosses, but it... Where, where a local boss is, who's using influence and intimidation to try to control his, his little district, and we have one party democracy, we have one party state in Chicago. National parties, if they lose popular support, if the voters don't actually think this person, besides being rich, is also not do, if they don't think he's, besides being rich, he's also doing a good job, if that's what they think, if they don't, if they're discontent, in a, in a, in a decentralized democracy, national parties, uh, rival national parties, cannot be prevented from coming in and sponsoring alternatives. It, so think about all levels making democracy more com effective, more competitive well, it's a, it's in, in multi-layer democracies. Yeah, you put the idea very straightforwardly, and I get it. My question is, from your dealings with Ukrainian politicians yeah. at, all, uh, at various levels over the last few years, do they get it genuinely now? I think people do get it, but I'll tell you, any, we have, I think the, the leaders of this country are... Are, are patriotic people. However, as an economist, I have to observe that when I say local democracy by creating new competition in the long run will give the Ukrainian people a more competitive, better competition at the national level is one of the benefits that Ukrainians should look for. You should observe that, of course, those people who are already at the top really actually have no particular interest. It goes against their personal interests yeah, right. to have better competition. So I understand that there is likely to be resistance. I understand that the leaders of this country, I believe, truly are patriots who want a better country, and I hope that they will realize that, that when they advocate reform, although that's decentralization reform, although that's going to make their future competition more, more difficult, it's better for the country, and they are, as Tony Blair said, doing the right thing. Yeah, well, that's right. He did say that, but he said it with a chuckle, as though some politicians don't always see it no, that way. Can, can I, can, no, well, you can't. No, okay. you can't, because we're running short of time, and I want to get a couple of questions in. Uh, but because of the, the long and fascinating lunch, we're, we're, I'm afraid, up against the clock. So, uh, yeah, Thomas, you've got a question? Sorry. 
Well, this is the 11th edition of the uh, YES meeting, and this is the very first time that there's a roundtable on decentralization. And this is also the very first time that we have a representative of the Tatar community mm. on stage, although this year it's not taking place in Yalta. So I think this demonstrates the enormous change that is taking place in Ukraine, and I think this is very positive. Uh, there is a consensus, a political consensus on decentralization. Now, I fear that people may sometimes be a bit naive about how easy it is, not only to do the process of decentralization, but then to run decentralization in a clear and effective way. The country in which I grew up, France, is a very centralized country. There was a very big wave of decentralization in 1983. This led to a dramatic increase of corruption because people at the department or regional level get huge power and were exposed to very big financial temptation. So my question to the panel is, how do you make a decentralization process that is effective where there are checks and balances at the local level? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I mean, Roger Meissen essentially said, you've got to believe me, that decentralizing power leads to better governance. But, but your message is, actually, that's I, by no means a given. Uh, Yves Le Terme, you, you're from a country which, you know, is pretty decentralized. Take that on. Goes with, uh, responsibility goes with transparency and accountability. And so when you, um, well, when you give competences to a local level, you have to have uh, people uh, that are appointed by elections and they have to be accountable. And this accountability has to be underpinned by transparency on what happens. And, and this is, uh, uh, of course, key to make, it, to make uh, uh, the transfer of resp responsibility successful. That's uh, essential. Very, very, very quickly then, Timothy. Yeah. The, the, the discussion about decentralization is part of a larger discussion about the rule of law. I think when decentralization happens, each of the oblasts or whatever the unit is going to be should have its own oblast level uh, corruption ombudsman. Because one of the problems with corruption in this country is that it too is centralized and the discussion is centralized. You have brilliant journalists talking about a few scandals, whereas corruption is actually a national problem. So I think the investigation of it should be in this constitutional reform put also at the level of the oblasts. So it's a whole political culture that needs to change. And in fact, the mindset of every individual Ukrainian needs to change. Yeah, uh, you, Rifat, you're going to have to be very quick because we're out of time. From my point of view, decentralization is the formation of local power, local authority, according to the rules that are established by the law that provide for the representation and efficient participation in governance of all the composites of the society. I mean, what we were not able to provide for in Crimea. If we really want to achieve decentralization, we have to write into law a lot of spheres. For instance, democratic election laws that were in place in Crimea could not allow, did not allow Crimean Tatars to be elected to bodies of authority, so we have to uh, write down into separate laws something that is specific for this territory. Not a per Corruption is an extremely important topic. I disagree that corruption cannot be mustered, can, cannot be curbed. Uh, should we have a will, uh, there are mechanisms that uh, we can uh, make public administration uh, transparent and accountable. In Poland today, at the Wojewodstwo level, where the major um, wealth is centered and nobody uh, strives to get to the central parliament, everyone wants a place where they live and where they can affect uh, governance processes. And corruption fell to the minimum level in Poland, where uh, there is theft in Ukraine. Uh, the appointment process is totally co corrupt when uh, regional representatives are uh, appointed. Um, uh, 
uh, theft occurs uh, at the company level when uh, certain people are planted to do so in con uh, companies, produ uh, production companies including. So we can uh, transfer to e-governance. We should make all the public administration really a public process, a publicly transparent process. Uh, when we discuss how we will go out of this war, we will do that through reforms, through deregulation, uh, when we have 50 different controlling bodies who come having no functions but uh, to create problems to the entrepreneurs. So we should delegate all the powers and competences to the communities who will know where corruption is focused and will target it. Of course, we do have a, a huge uh, issue of uh, the initial period where some criminals can get into power, but uh, the feedback would be so prompt between those who live in certain villages or municipalities and those who uh, create uh, wealth and though, uh, those who abuse uh, wealth uh, uh, so that people will know how to remove those uh, people, those bad apples from the bunch. So uh, it won't be enough to, for us to wait for a good prime minister, but we should start from the uh, grassroots level, where people can control their... ...sum up message for the future of Ukraine. And I think I'm going to, unfortunately, I know there are questions still on the floor, but I'm going to have to close here, just simply to observe that you know, there is a clear consensus on this panel that, that decentralization of power has to be a part of building Ukraine and a successful integrated future for Ukraine. It has to be a part of what happens in this country. I'm just very aware that elections are coming. We'll see what kind of politicians come from this election. I, I'm sorry, Roger, but I'm going to have to close. Uh, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I'm just, unfortunately, against the clock. Uh, so let's see what happens after the election. Let's see what happens in a year's time. Let's see what the distribution of power in this country looks like in a year. What, please go ahead. Last, one last word. All right, go on then. We have talked, all of us, about the advantages of decentralization. Uh, I, I think I may be the only one who credited the president of Russia with bringing decentralization into, to such an intense topic by his demand. I simply want to observe that in t December 2004, it is important for me to observe, I'm sorry. Go on. In December of 2004, Vladimir Putin centralized the government of Russia by removing the, the, the ability of, of, of the provinces to elect the governors and make them presidential appointees. Every argument that's been given here and more is a good reason why we can all hope this is a meeting about Ukraine, but for the good of Russia also, we hope that the president of Russia might consider applying his, these arguments also to his federation. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I like the point. It's worth remembering. One can only hope that Vladimir Putin is going to read the readouts from this particular conference. I do hope he's going to do that.